A long, long time ago, like in the 16 to 1700s long time ago, people in Europe had rather creative ways to humiliate, torture, and punish criminals. From publicly displaying people locked in pillories to whipping and, well, branding. But one very unique form of punishment was handed out to an unidentified prisoner of the state during the reign of Louis XIV of France. While the true identity of the guy remains a mystery, it's the fact that this poor dude's head was encased inside a literal iron mask that is important. As I'm sure, it served as the inspiration for one of G.I. Joe's most iconic enemies of all time, the silver-headed weapons manufacturer, Destro. The enemy known simply as Destro comes from a centuries-old family from Scotland, the McCullens. Actually, the name Destro is really like a title given to the head of the McCullen clan. Anyway, from as long as can be remembered, the McCullens made a name for themselves as master weapons crafters and suppliers. And it was in the mid-1600s where a member of the clan was caught supplying weapons to both sides of the English Civil War and was arrested. As punishment, he was forced to wear a steel mask. I'm assuming that despite his duplicity, the weapons supplier was much too valuable to just outright unalive. And so as a compromise, he was instead given this permanent and lasting symbol of shame and disgrace to wear for the rest of his life. But the joke was ultimately on his punisher, as said mask was instead turned into a badge of honor and loyalty to their craft, worn by every succeeding head, or destro, of the McCullen clan. Which brings us to the present day, with the McCullens as founders and owners of the Military Armaments Research Syndicate, or MARS for short the largest manufacturer of state-of-the-art weaponry systems in the world, and led by the current laird of the McCullen clan, James McCullen Destro the 24th, or simply Destro. Like most kids of the 80s, I was introduced to Destro in the toy commercial for his action figure. Right from the start, I knew that this guy was something special. I mean, any character who gets his own variation of the G.I. Joe theme song has got to be a big deal. But it's not what he does in the commercial, which was to single-handedly commandeer the then top vehicle of the Joes, the Mobat tank, but what he looks like that left a lasting impression on me as a kid. I mean, anyone wearing a predominantly form-fitting black uniform, enlarged high red collar with an exposed chest and huge chained ruby amulet is sure to get anyone's attention. But the cherry on top would be his birthright as laird of his clan, his shiny silver noggin. Vac metalized for extra shine. Unfortunately, I never got Destro's action figure as a kid, but I had a friend who did, and when I finally got him in hand, I noticed even more details that I found pretty skibbity. First of all was his backpack, which could open up and hold his little pea shooter, which looked nothing like any real-world pistol. But even cooler were his wrists, which had a couple of red rockets on one side, and what I imagined was something equally explosive on the other. But that's enough of his original toy for now. As interesting a history as Clan Destro has, I think that Destro himself has quite a cool story to go over. So let's get to it, shall we? Before he was the head of Mars and battling G.I. Joe alongside his Hermano from another Mother O, Cobra Commander, young James McCullen was basically a spoiled little rich kid working with his father in running the family frozen banana stand. Cause you know, there's always money in the banana stand. Oh wait, sorry, I was thinking of another father and son duo. Scratch that. In the late 60s, little James would be a constant companion with his dad on his business trips around the world. In one notable meeting in Vietnam, the elder Destro was set to sell weapons to representatives from the South Vietnamese government. It's here that the father and son meet another individual, a humanitarian, the Baron Eugene de Cobray, traveling with his daughter Anastasia, who was there to bring in medical supplies. Unfortunately, their contacts turn out to be Northern Viet Cong agents. Throw in a bunch of American soldiers, and what you end up with is a firefight that, fortunately, both Destro survive. But unfortunately, the elder de Cobray doesn't. Initially, the Americans, specifically a certain dude named Snake Eyes, is blamed for the Baron's death. But fortunately, Daddy Destro clears his name with his expert knowledge on ballistics. I know that this may seem like a rather random story of fortune and misfortune, but all you ought to know is that the Baron's daughter survives and grows up to be the Baron Ness. 
who I'm sure you know ends up having quite the relationship with Destro, one of the most iconic and lasting couples, or dare I say, love stories in the G.I. Joe universe. Until it is challenged by a certain pink-haired individual. But we'll get to that story a little later on. Anyway, years later, after his father's death, James took over the family business as the current Destro we all know and love and continued selling his state-of-the-art weaponry to the highest bidders who more often than not usually turn out to be some of the most vile, criminal, and ruthless terrorist organizations determined to rule the world. And of course, this brings Destro into his equally long-lasting love-hate relationship with Cobra. At this point, I think it would be worth noting that for the most part, despite his close connections to Cobra, Destro's role in the general G.I. Joe universe is defined by a set of responsibilities and loyalties that appertain to his position as both an arms dealer for Cobra and upholding the power and honor associated with the McCullen legacy. And it is the reason why Destro oftentimes holds a professional distance from Cobra that naturally led to the often paranoid Cobra commander to eventually suspect Destro of plotting behind his back to take over Cobra for himself. To be fair to the commander, his suspicions were pretty much on key, as Destro, who hated incompetence and inefficiency, ultimately felt that Cobra's potential was being squandered by what he viewed as the commander's erratic and disingenuous leadership. And add to the fact that Destro was cozying up with the commander's most trusted lieutenant, the Baroness, whom he discovered had a past relationship with a weapon supplier. So, in the end, Cobra Commander hires the assassin Major Blood to take out Destro during a battle with the Joes, with the Baroness and the commander driving his tanks into battle with their respective gunners Blood and Destro on top. The Major suddenly turns to his side to target the unsuspecting Destro. Fortunately, the Baroness realizes Blood's intentions and abruptly swerves their his tank, causing it to crash and explode. Unfortunately, while Blood manages to escape the wreck, the Baroness is caught in the explosion and is severely injured. But don't worry, Baroness fans, she doesn't die. Despite spending a good portion of time as a mummy, she survives. Later in the issue, as they make their escape, Cobra Commander has yet another chance to take out Destro as he battles with the Joe Leader Hawk on the back of the Commander's his tank. But ultimately, he chooses to take out Hawk, and so Destro lives to fight another day. And speaking of another day, how about helping give my channel a new day to tell more stories by giving this story a like or comment down below. And as always, if you still haven't, a sub would go a long, long way as would becoming a friend of the toy shelf to enjoy early access and exclusive videos. But ultimately, however little or big way you choose to help me out, it will be very much appreciated, so thank you. Anyway, the next major story arc for Destro would come issues later with the rise of the new Cobra Emperor, Serpentor. In one of his first major operations, Serpentor leads Cobra in an attack on the Joe team's super-secret subterranean headquarters, The Pit. Unbeknownst to the bad guys though, at this point the pit was mostly abandoned and laced with explosives to bring the whole thing down. Cobra Commander and Destro lead the charge into the pit and are unfortunately caught in a series of explosions that leaves them both buried under tons of rubble. Hello darkness, my old friend indeed. The duo, thanks to a ton of plot armor, managed to survive and ultimately escape. Once out, disguised as Sean Connery and Bernie for the weekend, they go their separate ways, with Cobra Commander reunited with his long-thought-dead son Billy deciding to turn over a new leaf. Another story for another time. And Destro returning to his ancestral castle in Scotland to regroup as well. Unfortunately, Destro finds his castle already occupied by another Destro who accuses him of being a fake. But thanks to the unexpected help of the Joes Flint and Lady J, who apparently is actually a distant relative of the McCullens, the real Destro manages to take back his castle and expose the fake Destro, who turns out to be Major Blood, sent by Serpentor to steal even more tech plans for his latest creation, the Technodrome. Wait, sorry, I meant the Terror Drome. Basically, cluing in Destro on the Emperor's plan to get into the action of the international arms market. To counter this, Hasbro creates a brand new faction with its own shiny logo to sell even more toys to us kiddies. But in-universe, all those new toys translate into Destro's own personal army of iron grenadiers with cool new vehicles. How cool you may ask? Well, 
so cool that in an alternate universe, the Decepticon leader Megatron uses one of them, the helicopter slash tank hybrid the Dominator, for his new alt mode. Of course, Destro's own uniform is leveled up as well, topped off with a new golden head to, you know, show that this time he means business. With this new faction in play, he enters the fray right in the middle of a Cobra Civil War where a supposedly returned Cobra commander battles and ultimately defeats Serpentor, thanks Zartan, to take back leadership of Cobra. And in all the chaos, Destro basically just chills on the beach and when the dust settles, manages to accomplish his main objective, which was to take back the Baroness without firing a single shot. Anyway, another interesting chapter in Destro's story was told in the Devil's Jew comics, which was originally meant to be a continuation of the Marvel story. In this next chapter, Destro is not in the best of shapes, holed up in his castle, bedridden, and suffering from a debilitating family illness. And we are introduced to his long-lost son, Alexander, from a pre-Baroness relationship. Anyway, wanting to prove his worthiness to his father and the McCullen clan, Alexander takes up the identity of Destro and continues to fight against G.I. Joe. Ultimately though, Alexander turns out to be half the man his father is and fails time and time again. In the end, the OG Destro recovers, returns, and takes his rightful place as the laird of Castle Destro. And Alexander, well, he's benched. See, the thing about Alexander was that he was overeager and too overly ambitious, and unfortunately lacked the vision that his father had. See, the true Destro didn't mess around with itty bitty things like nanomites. He built grand inventions like mass devices, weather dominators, and pyramids of darkness to take on the Joes. And while none of these contraptions led him and Cobra to victory, it sure was a lot of fun seeing both teams scavenger hunt around the world and battle over them. Yeah, the Destro from the cartoon wasn't as complex as his comics version, but he was still equally entertaining. I will never forget the time he basically took over the reins from Cobra Commander, calling him a psychotic sibilant serpent of adult. Say that ten times fast. Lifting up and tossing him away like a rag doll. Oh, and after taking a cheap shot, getting hit on the back of his head by a flying Cobra Scepter, Destro casually gets back up, laughs and returns said Scepter but not before squishing the metal scepter head with a single bare hand, right in front of the face of the commander. Now that's one Sigma dude right there. Oh, and one thing I didn't know as a kid was that Destro was voiced by the actor Arthur Burghardt, who also voiced Devastator in the Transformers. And not that it really mattered in the grand scheme of things, but I found it quite amusing that Mr. Burghardt, an African-American, voiced a Scottish character. And yeah, listening to it now, it's pretty obvious, but more than that, despite not having a Scottish accent, Destro's voice is one of the most recognizable and iconic voices from the cartoons. And speaking of the cartoons, yes, I know that a majority of the fandom would like to believe that it ended with Sanbo, and that the series that followed after by Deke doesn't exist. But I actually watched Operation Dragonfire last month in its entirety for the first time ever, and I have to say, I didn't hate it. Anyway, I bring that show up to point out that in it, Destro had that undeniable riz with the way he charmed both Baroness and Zorana and had them fighting for his affections. He actually ended up dumping the Baroness for Zorana, and the Baroness then runs off with a dreadnought Nogahide. I swear I'm not making this up. In the end, however, Destro comes to his senses, goes back to the Baroness, and gets rid of Zorana at the push of a button, dropping her down a literal trap door. Definitely not quality storytelling, but entertaining nonetheless. Slightly raising the level of storytelling, but not by much, was the 2009 live-action movie The Rise of Cobra. Destro was the main antagonist of the movie. Played by the actor Christopher Eccleston, best known as the ninth Doctor in Doctor Who, this Destro doesn't stray much from what we're typically used to in that he still comes from a long line of McCullen arms dealers, whose ancestor, James McCullen IX, was also punished by the French monarchy in the 17th century for selling weapons to both them and England, and condemned to have a red-hot iron mask welded onto his face. This Destro is also the head of Mars and secretly a terrorist. One notable detail they added was the origin of the name Destro in that it was short for Destroyer of Nations, which his family had been known for because of their shady arms dealing. Anyway, while he starts out looking like your typical evil, shady businessman, 
By the end of the movie, James McCullen's face is badly burned and is reconstructed with nanomites to give him his iconic silver metal mask. Destro is also shown in the beginning of the sequel movie, Retaliation, where he is left in his watery prison by an escaped Cobra commander who jokingly declares that he's out of the band. Poor guy. But ultimately, you can't really feel that bad for Destro. As being one of the major bad guys and enemies of the Joe team, Destro has been included in pretty much every iteration of the franchise in both the comics and cartoons. And because of that, we have never been left wanting for any Destro plastic representation in our collections. In the original vintage line, aside from the OG figure and his updated Iron Grenadier version in 1988, we got two more Destros before the line went on hiatus in 1994. The first was a rather unspectacular update of his original figure, bringing back the classic elements of his silver head and an even more pronounced red collar. But what came after that in 1993 was when things really got crazy, as we got a space-themed cyborg Destro as part of the subline, Star Brigade. And it's a good thing they stopped here, as while the line ended in 1994, there were prototypes made of more toys had the line continued the following year, where we would get another Destro as part of a new subline called Replicators. In a natural progression of going into space, the addition of actual aliens in the line was the next logical step. Inspired by the movie Aliens, the Replicators would feature Joes and Cobras, well, to be accurate, clones of our favorite characters who had the ability to have aliens burst out of their chests and do battle or in Destro's case, have his entire upper body literally break apart to reveal his alien surprise. You can check out the channel Toy Connections for a more comprehensive coverage of this rather kooky concept. I'll place a link in the description below. Another notable Destro concept was designed in 1997, but initially didn't see the light of day since the designers deemed it to be a little bit too over the top, with its deep maroon armor and leopard print details. Despite its cancellation though, a limited number of figures had already been produced and became quite popular with the fandom, lovingly referred to as Money Bags or Pimp Daddy Destro. And this legend grew so much that Hasbro finally gave us an official release of this guy in 2007, well into the modern 25th anniversary line, which also gave us a whole lot more Destros. The best of which, in my opinion, would be the last one released in 2014, which sported a more angular design to its mask, closer to the artwork on the original figure's card. And like the original figure, came with a weapon, this time a rifle, that could be taken apart and neatly stored inside a carry case. Most importantly though, unlike all the other modern versions of Destro released prior that I found all undersized, I felt that this one was the first one that was properly scaled, as I always saw Destro as a rather big fellow. And it would be Destro's size that would be my main issue with the last two versions of Destro that I got. The first in the larger 112 scale classified line, and the second from Super 7's Ultimates line. While I think both are great modern updates of the character, or in Super 7's case, pretty faithful recreations right out of the cartoon, I find both a bit small, especially in the case of the classified version. But overall, I'm good with both, although I do think I could use a classified pimp daddy Destro in my collection as well. And speaking of daddies, did you know that another prominent and iconic Cobra operative, Zartan, was also reunited with his long-lost daughter as well? If you want to know more about the Master of Disguise and his family, you can check out their story over here. Or if you want other Joe stuff, you can check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.